Good morning, everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be in the world. Thank you so much for joining us um, for this session on the politics and practice of universal health coverage, local, national, and global challenges. We have some excellent panelists uh, who are with us today. Uh, Kennedy Roberts, Oliver Eloreaga, Sulakshana Nandi, Frank Bikaba and Rubana Islam, and really looking forward to hearing their presentations. Um, thank you for joining us. As we all know, universal health coverage, UHC, including financial risk protection, is a key part of the sustainable development goals um, as uh, represented by target 3.8. Um, uh, of the sustainable development goals, excuse me. Um, it's also key to achieving so many of the other health targets, including reducing maternal and child mortality, ending epidemic diseases, preventing and treating NCDs and substance abuse, reducing mortality from road accidents, and really basically um, any health target that you can possibly think of. And it's also key to achieving the first SDG target, which is ending poverty in all forms. Uh, each year, about 100 million people are driven below the poverty line because of direct health payments. Um, furthermore, in this time of COVID, it's all the more important to move quickly towards UHC. Um, as Dr. Tedros uh, of the World Health Organization has said, uh, UHC and health security are two sides of the same coin. So strengthening health systems for UHC is the best way to safeguard against health crises. So um, to begin, uh, we would like to start with a poll. Um, we uh, would like to ask you, you should be able to see it on the uh, online um, uh, portal. Uh, is achieving UHC a political challenge or is it a technical challenge? So go ahead and answer that poll. If you get a chance, if you can see it. Great. Give just a few more seconds for people to answer. Okay, thank you for voting. So I uh, think everyone should be able to see the results. Uh, if not, 52% of you said that um, it's a political challenge and 48% of you said that you can't separate the two, political and technical challenge. Um, so I think that uh, if that's what you think, you're definitely in the right session. Um, we're gonna hear from our speakers today about how political challenges um, may not have necessarily been adequately planned for, but they still ended up being strong determinants of whether initiatives to uh, achieve UHC succeeded in very different contexts. Uh, for those of you who said that uh, you can't separate the two, I think this, this session is also proof of that. We have a set of brilliant researchers here uh, who are studying the problem of politics from an academic or technical lens. And that is to inform how UHC can be designed or implemented in highly technical contexts. So glad you're here, glad you're with us. Um, when it comes to, oh, sorry, could you go back to the last slide? Thanks. <laughs> um, just to um, a few points to set up what we're talking about here. Um, at least half of the world's population lacks access to universal health coverage. So this is a huge um, issue uh, in global health today. Um, you know, we can think about whether or not that's a question of cost. Um, you know, I'm from the United States, a very rich country that is sadly far from achieving universal health coverage. So it's not necessarily a question of cost. Um, you know, we might ask ourselves if it's a question of development, um, but we can look at countries with diverse development, and I use that word advisedly, um, statuses, countries like Thailand, Sri Lanka, Cuba, Ghana, all of which have made great progress towards UHC. Um, and if it's not uh, cost or development, could it be a question of the uh, right model? Well, I don't think so either because we've seen uh, lots of different pathways to getting to UHC. Um, 
that brings us, that leaves us with a very uh, key question of politics and why universal health coverage is political. Uh, first of all, most obviously it's a collective action problem that uh, requires many different stakeholders uh, to come together. It also has non-discrimination as a core principle. If it's universal, that means everyone has access. And we know that power and politics is at the core of ensuring that this principle is respected. Furthermore, shifts in research resource allocation are required and uh, politics and policy is about who gets what. So that's why the research conducted by our presenters today is so important and relevant. And what's really wonderful about our session is that we're gonna get a truly global view of the politics of UHC. We're gonna be looking um, at research from countries in Asia, Africa, Latin America, and the Caribbean. Next slide, please. So just to briefly introduce myself, my name is Sarah Dalglish. I'm an associate at the Johns Hopkins School of Public Health and at the Institute for Global Health at the University of College London. Uh, I work on issues of power and politics in health policy, uh, as well as global child health. I've done a bit of my research in West Africa and we're lucky uh, to be joined by a West African uh, presenter today and also uh, on qualitative methods. And I love to engage and interact on Twitter. So um, feel free to join the conversation there. Next slide, please. So I think uh, by now you should be familiar with the online platform. Um, you know that there's online live support. Uh, you also are probably aware that there's a Q and A session. So as you listen, to these presentations, please, uh, if you have any questions that you would like to ask the presenter, go ahead and put that in the uh, chat box, noting the um, presenter who the question is addressed to, and it could be um, several presenters. Um, as you know, the best experience is using full screen. These sessions are recorded, so um, they will be made available until March 31st. Um, and I think for the viewing capabilities, hopefully you've got that all set up. Next slide, please. So now we're gonna start with our first presentation. We are joined by Rubana Islam from the University of New South Wales, Australia, uh, who has many different public health interests. She's worked in urban health and equity, as we'll learn about in her presentation, uh, maternal and child health, non-communicable diseases and lifestyle behaviors, and e-health and m-health. And she's now uh, keen on focusing her work on health governance in low and middle income countries. So without further ado, let's go on to her presentation on contracting out urban PHC for the urban poor in Bangladesh, the influence of politics and power on provider performance. Hello everyone, I'm Rubana and today I'm going to present uh, a paper on the influences of politics and power on urban primary healthcare providers' uh, performance in Bangladesh. Now, before I plunge into the details of the study, let me provide you the context in which it was conducted. Historically, in Bangladesh, the majority of the population lived in urban areas, as seen in the green shaded uh, region of the first figure. But since 2005, the rural population growth has been slowing down as seen in, as evident by the um, uh, slowing down as evident from the downward slope and the urban growth is um, has been has shown an exponential rise. At present, one third of the population lives in the cities, but it is expected to go up to 60% by 2050. While urban areas promise access to greater um, economic opportunities and healthcare uh, services, they are not equitably distributed among all urban residents. Um, disaggregated health indicators suggest that the urban poor living in the slums experience the worst health outcomes. Uh, for example, the under five mortality ratio uh, was 95% uh, in 2013 um, among urban slums compared to the 53% um, in the non-slum non urban areas and the 66% 66 in the rural counterparts. 
So um, urban slum residents experience the worst health indicators in Bangladesh. Now, the urban health system is in a bit of uh, chaos with a pluralistic arrangement. Uh, various providers are involved, but there is no coordination and um, very poor regulation at the moment. While there are public, many public and private tertiary hospitals in the urban um, areas. Publicly funded primary health care is limited, uh, leaving a big chasm in the health system. To fill this gap, a donor funded project was started with the Ministry of Local Government that contracted NGOs to provide services for the urban poor. Now, this project is called the Urban Primary Healthcare Service Delivery Project. And um, uh, this has been operational since 1998, and its fourth phase is underway at the moment. We, at this, in this paper, we are specifically interested um, to examine the influences of performance uh, on performance variations of these contracted NGOs. And um, for this paper specifically, uh, the sorry. We conducted a qualitative study uh, and 42 key informants were interviewed during 2014 and 2017. And we also conducted a pro um, review of project documents. Now, specifically for this um, uh, analysis, we use the multi-level framework for primary healthcare governance in low and middle income countries to identify politics and power at various levels of gov governance and relationship dynamics. Within each of the governance groups, that is the constitutional, the collective and the operational um, governance groups, further breakdown based on the organogram and specific settings uh, within the specific settings uh, are possible, as we'll see in the next slide. So uh, this, now let's take a close look at how the um, interactions between these governance groups actually look like in reality. The Urban Primary Healthcare Service Delivery Project was led by the Ministry of Local Government. However, health in general is the mandate of Minister of Health and Family Welfare. And they're also in charge of providing clinic licenses and family planning products. Now, pre-existing tensions between these two ministries set up a tricky ground you know, for the NGOs to trade on. Interministerial friction meant there were delays in sanctioning application requests for clinic licenses and family planning products by the NGOs, which um, delayed providing um, timely service provision. Now, some NGO managers reported that they used their, shall we say, magic uh, through personal networking with the Ministry of Health and could obtain needful permissions and sup uh, supplies on time. Tensions were also present within the project. One of the project directors had a less than congenial relationship uh, with the secretary at, at the Ministry of Local Government. This also led to delays in obtaining necessary medical equipments by the NGOs. Now, um, uh, there was also politicization, said one of the participants uh, of the project itself. So someone said, one man, uh, NGO manager shared, one of the project staff was appointed from the leading political party. Opposition party, as in NGO heads or managers who supported um, the opposition political party uh, had difficulty in coordinating with this project officer. Other central level influences reported were um, how there was um, selection process was hampered uh, and NGOs who did not meet selection criteria were given the contract in return of unseen money, as one of the project officers said. These um, NGOs were unprepared to provide services at the required standard, hence their performance um, varied. Now, power exercise was not limited only to the higher levels of governance. Uh, it was also experienced from uh, collective governance levels. Now, engaging uh, while engaging local community leaders helped some NGOs to uh, 
have greater reach uh, of um, and attract more clients, thus getting higher points for service coverage. At the same time, personal interest from uh, local elites uh, to get free services for their own people meant free services were not provide could not be provided to the ultra poor who really needed them. So. Also, um, pressures from centralized government and the collective governance um, were felt by the NGOs on hiring their favored uh, personnel despite uh, not meeting qualifications. Um, there could also be some positive aspects where mayors have been reported to be very helpful in finding doctors where it was a problem to retain doctors in some of the clinics. Now, in reality, this is how uh, the uh, whole, whole picture looks like. It is rather complicated and complex. And this is why research is necessary into these processes to understand the layered reality of primary healthcare services, um, service provision in LMICs. Now, uh, contracting out is theorized to be a better service modality compared to government provided health services. However, as you have seen, its potential may be impaired where politics and power are exercised against the service delivery objectives. More and more LMICs are adopting uh, models for mo this modality for their healthcare services with support from uh, international global health bodies. Before and during uh, contracting out implement uh, implementation, the these power relationships must be mapped and made visible and contract designers must incorporate mechanisms to overcome them for better success of contracting out mechanisms thank you Great, thank you so much for that um, <laughs> for that fabulous presentation, um, looking at the issue of contracting out of PhD services in urban Bangladesh and the uh, big P and small P political issues that come with it. Uh, now we're going to go on to Oliver Eloreaga, who is a researcher at the Pontificia Universidad Católica del Perú. Um, he is an economist and a master of science in epidemiological research uh, sciences and a member of the group for innovation of social and health policies. He's also received funding from the International Initiative for Impact Evaluation from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And his primary int research interests include social reforms to improve health and conditions of inequity, as well as innovative interventions to aid marginalized populations. And uh, his presentation today is a uh, brief institutional analysis of public health insurance in Peru, uh, looking at the case of Seguro Integral de Salud. So uh, let's now go to Oliver's presentation. Hi, my name is Oliver Eloriaga. On behalf of myself and my co-author, Edmundo Beteta, we present the research a brief institutional analysis of public health insurance in Peru, the case of Seguro Integral de Salud. We thank Oxfam Peru and Pontificia Universidad Católica for funding this research. What is Seguro Integral de Salud? CIS is a national health insurance in Peru created in 2002 to expand access to health services among the wider public. As a nation primary public insurer, CIS provides financial protection for more than half of the country population especially poor and vulnerable communities. The target population is around 21 million people and the annual fund per person is around $31 to cover medicines and variable costs. We have to consider that due to, that due to the fragmented funding, it doesn't include main costs such as personal and medical equipment, which is covered by other sources. The purpose of this study is to explore institutional factors that can facilitate vulnerabilities in this management of value resources. The question is, what are the institutional barriers and what we could do to reinforce the institutional capacities of this? Also, this question could give us a better comprehension of Peruvian health issues during the current COVID-19 pandemic. 
Likewise, our question could be also interesting for countries with fragmented health funding like us. We use a conceptual framework based on institutional economies, regulatory governance, and healthcare financing. We review documentary sources like core reports, legislation, and administrative documentation from CIS. We apply a proposed sampling, which gives us 13 interviews. The interviews profiles include uh, current former authorities or health institutions, and experts from the academic and private sector. We also apply a workshop with key actors and experts from the health sector. In that workshop, we share the preliminary results. The interviews were anonymized and the study was approved by the Ethics Committee of Catholica University. Following institutional framework provided by Matawer and Carrin, we can identify five elements of institutional design. First, absence of rules. In the public health sector, it is related to inconclusive normative of funding. Number two, inadequate rules. For example, the normative that regulates the relationship between the insurer and health providers. Number three, we rule compliance related to the principal agent problem in health system. Number four, weak organizational capacity. It is related to difficulties in monitoring healthcare providers. And number five is functional inter-organizational relationship. It is related to the coordination among institutions of health services. Our results. The literature review highlighted an incomplete reform of health system in Peru. Combined with the interview data, uh, we discern seven central issues. First, lack of control of who receives this insurance coverage. For example, in 2016, more than 1 million non-poor people were insured when being classified as poor was a requirement. Number two, inconsistencies in health records. In 2017, auditing detected cases like one patient with 200 cataract surgeries, women with more than one birth in two months, among other issues like them. Number three, unjustified deviation of resources to private sector. For example, procedures as, such as tomography, hemodialysis, radiotherapy, for some of them, CIS paid significantly higher prices. And number four, financial mismanagement. The budget for, for and sometimes the budget for patients was mislocated to administrative staff or healthcare providers receive hyperpayments in agreement with CIS. Number five, excessive increase in payment for emergencies to private sector. CIS was committed to pay for emergency services if the insurance by CIS were treated in private clinics. The cost of these emergencies increased from less than $1 million to $40 million of dollars in less than two years. Six, irregular increase in funding for burial services. CIS funding includes burial coverage. However, administrative staff approve payment to non-existent people or allow multiple payments for the same disease. And number seven, restricted capacities in the management of public funds. The CIS should manage a fund according to the health insurance premium rate, but CIS doesn't have one. Also, the, me the mechanism for providing um, resources to hospital and monitor them are failing to improve healthcare outcomes. As a synthesis, in the following graph, we summarize the correspondence between, on the left, the concept of institutional design, in the middle, the seven issues reviewed in the previous slide, and on the right, five policy proposals that will help to overcome this problem. As we could see in the previous slide, our policy proposal can be summarized in five key points. Number one, appropriate finding for the insurance institution. As the primary insurance institution, CIS is neither a social program nor a transfer agency. It requires a budget based on expected healthcare expenditures. Number two, development of strategic purchasing. CIS should be an active purchaser, reduce costs, and provide incentives for better results among healthcare providers. Number three, reorganization and building capacities. It's necessary to empower CIS with more efficient health information system and technologies to track the budget execution of healthcare providers. Number four, separation of function in the health system. The, he the Ministry of Health must strengthen its stewardship role and the CIS as a public insurer requires more autonomy. Number five, 
a stronger interinstitutional coordination. It's necessary to have better interoperability between institutions in the health sector. Likewise, it's also necessary with ministries like economy and social inclusion. Finally, our findings suggest that this can improve its services through strategic purchasing a mechanism like paid for performance. It could create incentives for effective management. However, political support for reforming the fragmented health financing is crucial. This can actively improve its accountability and management in collaboration with health providers to reduce inefficiency and corruption. Thank you for Wonderful. Thank you so much for that presentation, Oliver, um, on uh, <laughs> public health insurance in Peru, publicly funded health insurance, um, and the need for political support to strengthen uh, fragmented health financing. Uh, now we're going to move on to Dr. Subakshana Nandi, who joins us from the Public Health Resource Network and the University of the Western Cape in India. Uh, she is a founding member of CHOPAL, a tribal resource agency that supports community-based organizations in working on the right to food and health, forest rights, and gender and tribal rights. She's involved in research, capacity building, and advocacy on issues related to health equity and access, and policy, excuse me, and public policy and programs for health and nutrition, with a focus on gender and vulnerable communities. Dr. Nandi is the co-chair of People's Health Movement uh, Global Steering Council. And uh, she will speak today about the failure of publicly funded health insurance schemes to provide financial protection, looking at the role of power, social institutions, and political economy of health of healthcare. So let's go to the presentation. Uh, today we'll be speaking about the failure of publicly funded health insurance schemes to provide financial protection and the role of power, social institutions and the political economy of healthcare. A study uh, that I undertook along with Professor Helen Schneider. So first I want to uh, talk about the publicly funded health insurance schemes in India and in Chhattisgarh, their objectives. Um, and um, uh, their timeline. So uh, as you all know that publicly funded health insurance schemes have been introduced uh, under the universal health coverage uh, discourse and uh, the stated objectives have been to decrease uh, financial burden on the poor and vulnerable groups and uh, ensure their access to quality health services, whether it is from the public or the private sector, so giving that choice and uh, also to provide cashless or free services. Uh, in Chhattisgarh, the National Health uh, Insurance Scheme uh, started in 2009, which was then um, universalized in 2012. And then it got further expanded in 2018 under the Pradhan Mantri Jan Arugya Yojana, uh, uh, the national scheme, in which increased the insurance coverage per household uh, from 30,000 rupees to 500,000 rupees. Now, the uh, how different? How have the uh, how, how has the design of the PFHI schemes been different from previous uh, uh, systems of healthcare delivery? And what are the assumptions on regulation that have been made? Uh, so this is a this was seen as a purchasing mechanism for from the public and the private sector, uh, which would give choice to patients to go to whichever uh, hospital they want. And, uh, and a big emphasis has been on the IT systems that the whole program is run on. Now, the assumption is that the strategic purchasing would lead to regulation of the providers, especially the private sector, and the choice would lead to accountability. And the IT systems will help uh, in reducing fraud and market or the competition will basically take care uh, of the rest of the issues. The study that we did um, uh, in Chhattisgarh uh, the, the rational was that, you know, studies till date have mainly focused on utilization and financial protection. And that has actually shown that, you know, the schemes have not led to free services and most private hospitals continue to charge extra. And there is less research on the way this whole thing happens. You know, this whole thing plays out in, uh, uh, in hospitals between the patient and the 
uh, service providers. And this also includes the acceptability dimension that includes agency pr power, trust, and choice. So this study explored these dynamics of access under the scheme in Chhattisgarh. And it was a qualitative study. Uh, and eight uh, case studies were purposefully, people uh, and family experiences were purposefully chosen. Uh, people who had utilized private sector and had incurred very high out-of-pocket expenditure. So the findings from the patient's narratives show that uh, they tried to exercise their agency to the extent that they could, you know, they were engaged in constant negotiation and, uh, you know, from pre-hospitalization to, uh, you know, discharge. And, uh, you know, they also spoke about whether the card or whether insurance is going to be used for their admission. And they also spoke about, you know, how much additional money, or uh, you know, the hospital would be asking them for. Uh, however, despite all this negotiation, once admitted, uh, the families kept being um, presented with higher and higher bills. And uh, also, uh, they faced a lot of uh, conflict. There was a lot of conflict. And uh, whenever they were trying to negotiate, uh, you know, the hospitals really uh, sort of uh, uh, came down on them pretty harshly. Uh, and this continued to the process of discharge, whether, you know, they, most in most cases, they had to pay a final amount uh, and the hospitals use strategies such as, uh, you know, uh, keeping the insurance card with them, not letting it go or keeping the, uh, you know, records, the, the, the x-ray uh, reports with the hospital uh, so that the patient cannot be taken to a, a less expensive or a government hospital. And uh, the patients and the families faced abused when they were not able to pay and they finally had to pay uh, one way or the other. Uh, so, so people actually uh, had to mortgage their jewelry they uh, they had to mortgage uh, i mean one case had to mortgage the motorcycle uh, and in that way uh, they they had to pay uh, the final amount and while people did know that you know the rules that you know the insurance scheme gave free care uh, meant free care but they also knew that in practice this never happened and the insurance smart card the biometric card and the grievance redressal systems basically also failed them and they really did not trust these systems uh, and, and as I said, you know, while they were far from passive players, you know, in this whole interaction, I mean, at the end, there was a general sense of, you know, helplessness and complete powerlessness in which they were not able to influence uh, the way things went. Uh, so the analysis that we did, uh, so we found that the outcomes were produced by a combination of one was the failure of the, you know, key regulatory mechanisms, the dominant norms of care as a, a you know, a market transaction rather than a right, and the white cultural acceptance of illegal healthcare payments and the unfavorable normative and cultural context of the private sector provisioning, and you know the, the you know the power relationships uh, between I mean the huge gap uh, you know in power with, between the providers and 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 the patients who are from you know lower socioeconomic uh, background. Uh, so we developed a conceptual framework of access uh, and uh, factors influencing access under the publicly funded health insurance schemes. Uh, so uh, in the middle, at the core, you have the utilization or the hospitalization event in which the three dimensions of access, acceptability, affordability, and availability basically in interact with each other and influence each other. These, uh, 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 and this whole uh, uh, interaction is between the patient, the provider, and also the government as a purchaser. Uh, and, and the whole process of navigation and negotiation continues uh, uh, in this process. And this is influenced by the regulatory norms, uh, uh, the, the normative uh, environment and the, uh, you know, and culture, um, uh, which again is influenced by, you know, how, uh, what the political economy of, uh, you know, healthcare is. Uh, the social structures, the power structures in society, the social institutions, uh, you know, in society, the power differences, uh, the extent of commodification of healthcare, uh, and uh, you know the way healthcare is seen uh, within uh, that, that that particular political economy uh, of healthcare at that particular time. Um, so the lessons for future of publicly funded health insurance schemes uh, that emerge out of this. Um, study are that one that simply looking at utilization is not enough and it does not necessarily need real access or financial protection 
and while health encounters are are already very unequal uh, however power and information asymmetry are more pronounced in uh, you know healthcare markets and when you're looking at the private healthcare uh, sector and when you're uh, uh, getting them to um, uh, provide services uh, functioning of such schemes really cannot be divorced from the larger institutions uh, the structures within which the, the they are you know embedded and policy makers really need to take this into account and also need to take into account the nature and extent of power symmetries asymmetries while designing such programs and i think the most uh, uh, important lesson that we found was that you know rapidly scale i mean such programs when you know you have a weak regulation and you have uh, you know a huge power asymmetry it it may actually lead to uh, reinforcing societal inequities and power and economic uh, disparities uh, rather than uh, ensuring a more equitable uh, healthcare so uh, thank you very much and you can read more about this study um, in this uh, Great, um, wonderful presentation uh, from Sulakshana Nandi, looking at uh, power asymmetries and the way that publicly funded health insurance schemes are really uh, embedded and inseparable from pre-existing social and institutional structures. Uh, our next presentation is from Franck Bicaba. His presentation uh, is in French, but it will be translated simultaneously into English. Um, so uh, Franck is a health economist and research uh, coordinator at the Société d'études et de recherche en santé publique in Burkina Faso. Uh, he is an economist, a health economist and a researcher who is interested essentially in um, questions around health policies, health systems, uh, universal health coverage and in health financing. For the past seven years, Honk has been involved in various research projects as an assistant, collaborator, researcher, and research coordinator. And he has published and contributed to publications uh, in multiple of these areas. Um, so today, Franck will be talking about uh, a reform in Burkina Faso, Burkina Faso to bring together um, uh, free healthcare for uh, certain population groups and universal health insurance. So bringing together those two policies, what challenges did that create for the health system in Burkina Faso? So let's go to the presentation. Bonjour, chers conférenciers. Je voudrais vous présenter une réforme en cours au Burkina Faso. Il s'agit notamment du jumelage de la gratuité des soins et de l'assurance maladie universelle avec pour questionnement quel défi pour le système de santé du Burkina Faso. En guise d'introduction, j'aimerais rappeler que euh, la gratuité des soins a démarré en 2016 à l'échelle nationale et ce au profit des femmes enceintes et des enfants de moins de 5 ans. Le régime d'assurance maladie universelle, quant à lui, a été adopté en 2015 dans le but, n'est-ce pas, de couvrir les risques financiers Euh, en cas de maladie. Un organe de gestion a été mis en place en 2018. Il s'agit de la Caisse nationale d'assurance maladie universelle. Donc, il faut dire que euh, cette caisse poursuit son euh, processus d'opérationnalisation. Notre intérêt euh, pour ces deux politiques pourrait se justifier par le fait que, en 2018, le gouvernement a décidé de transférer la gestion de la gratuité des soins vers justement cette caisse nationale d'assurance maladie universelle. D'où notre objectif ici euh, de pouvoir identifier les défis que soulève une telle réforme pour le système de santé. À partir donc euh, du cadre pour le renforcement des systèmes de santé de l'OMS et des entrevues informelles préparatoires, nous sommes parvenus à identifier quatre fonctions du système de santé qui représente des logiques et des enjeux spécifiques aux deux politiques objets de l'étude. 
Il s'agit, n'est-ce pas, de la gouvernance, du financement, de l'offre des services de qualité et aussi du système d'information et de suivi euh, des bénéficiaires. Les deux autres fonctions, notamment les ressources humaines et l'approvisionnement en médicaments essentiels, présentent plutôt des logiques similaires aux deux politiques objet de l'étude. C'est une étude essentiellement qualitative et de ce fait, nous avons réal effectué 15 entrevues, dont 11 entrevues au niveau du troisième échelon de la pyramide sanitaire, auprès des directions techniques, des partenaires techniques et financiers, mais aussi des ONG qui sont impliquées. Quatre entrevues, cette fois-ci au niveau du premier échelon de la pyramide sanitaire, mais avec euh, plutôt les responsables des mutuelles de santé. Nous avons aussi réalisé quatre focus group, toujours au niveau du premier échelon de la pyramide sanitaire, mais cette fois-ci avec les adhérents aux mutuelles de santé. Et par la suite, nous, sommes, nous avons procédé à une analyse thématique des, du contenu des entrevues euh, à l'aide du logiciel QDA Miner. Qu'est-ce que nous avons trouvé? Il faut dire qu'au niveau de la gouvernance, un des défis concerne les enjeux politiques. Certes, il y a une volonté euh, affichée des politiques à procéder à cette réforme, mais euh, force est de constater qu'il y a une lenteur dans la prise de certaines décisions. D'où, euh, n'est-ce pas, euh, notre interrogation sur les réelles motivations des décideurs. Un autre défi concerne l'absence d'une vision holistique de tout le processus de jumelage. Aujourd'hui, certains acteurs peinent à vous dire euh, comment, par exemple, euh, le recouvrement des taux de cotisation va être fait ou même comme, quelle stratégie mettre en place pour justement fidéliser les adhérents aux différentes mutuelles de santé. Et un autre défi, c'est la lourdeur administrative qui est très oppressante et qui rend difficile euh, l'application de certaines actions stratégiques. Sur le financement, on pourrait retenir essentiellement deux défis. Il s'agit de la faible mobilisation des ressources. L'État rencontre effectivement des difficultés à mobiliser des ressources pour à la fois financer la gratuité des soins, mais aussi euh, l'assurance maladie universelle. Et L'autre défi concerne les contraintes politiques à l'allocation des ressources. Il faut dire que de l'expérience de la gratuité, l'État enregistre des retards importants pour le remboursement des prestations au niveau des formations sanitaires, d'où la nécessité de pouvoir adapter les procédures. Concernant l'offre des services de qualité, d'aucuns estiment qu'il y aurait une charge de travail très importante du fait de l'augmentation de l'offre et de, de la fréquentation au point de contact, c'est-à-dire au niveau des formations sanitaires. D'où la nécessité de pouvoir réorganiser et améliorer la performance du personnel de santé. Un autre défi, c'est concerne plutôt les problèmes récurrents liés aux ruptures de stock de médicaments. Donc, si cela n'est pas résolu, euh, n'est-ce pas, euh, il impacterait négativement euh, cette réforme d'où la nécessité de pouvoir améliorer la gestion des intrants. Sur le système d'information et de suivi des bénéficiaires, il faut dire qu'ici, nous avons pu relever deux défis. Il s'agit premièrement de la variabilité du panier de soins. Il s'agit surtout des bénéficiaires de la gratuité des soins, parce qu'ils seront à cheval entre deux paniers, celui de la gratuité, mais aussi celui de l'assurance maladie universelle. Les parties prenantes appréhendent assez difficilement comment est-ce que le suivi de la trajectoire thérapeutique de cette cible-là va se faire concrètement. Il y a aussi la complexité même du processus de production de l'information. Certes, tous les adhérents aux mutuelles de santé dans le cadre de euh, cette réforme disposeront d'une carte d'assurance, n'est-ce pas? Mais force est de constater que au niveau des formations sanitaires, il y a un volume administratif important qui euh, constitue une difficulté pour les bénéficiaires. Alors, chers conférenciers, je voudrais euh, terminer en disant que euh, 
cette réforme est très utile pour euh, améliorer la couverture sanitaire au niveau du Burkina Faso. Cependant, nous avons touché du doigt un certain nombre de défis qui rendent assez difficile la mise en œuvre de cette réforme. Et le message qu'il faudrait retenir ici, c'est que l'efficacité et la pérennité d'une telle réforme dépendront nécessairement de la réponse que les principaux acteurs donneront ou apporteront à ces défis. Je vous remercie. Thank you very much, uh, Franck, for that presentation, uh, looking at two critical reforms in Burkina Faso, one fee exemptions for uh, mothers and children uh, under five years old, and the other uh, universal health insurance. And um, seeing how bringing those two reforms together uh, is really going to be a key determinant of success of both of them. Uh, now we're going to move on to our final presentation. Uh, this is from Kennedy Roberts, who is an instructor at uh, St. George's University. Mr. Roberts has been a faculty member of the Public Health Department uh, and Preventive Medicine at St. George's University since 1998. He has a bachelor's in economics from the University of the West Indies and an MPH from Boston University. And he was instrumental in developing the MPH program at St. George's University, where he teaches in the health policy and administration track. His research interest is in policymaking, health planning, financing, and management. And today he's going to be speaking to us uh, on a policy analysis he conducted of health financing reform in Grenada. So let's go to the presentation. Greetings and welcome to this presentation looking at a policy analysis of health financing reform in Grenada in the Caribbean. My name is Kennedy Roberts and this presentation was prepared jointly with a student of mine, Dr. Sasha Lake, who completed her master in public health at St. George's University. In the presentation, I'm going to do a little introduction to the topic, look at the methods we use in coming up with the information, the results and conclusion to the presentation. Now, the whole issue of healthcare financing reform in Grenada has been on the agenda since 1995. That's 25 years and counting since we've been discussing this issue, but it has been highlighted the importance now because over 50% of Grenada's health expenditure comes out of pocket. This was based on a study by the University of the West Indies in 2016. However, we all know that the world and Grenada is looking towards implementing national health insurance through the whole concept of universal health coverage, which is part of the sustainable development goals. I must po point out that the current administration in Grenada has been in office for over 20 of the last 25 years. So they have been primarily responsible for the issue of policy implementation. In doing the presentation, I use the framework of the policy triangle as the basis for analysis. And I must add that this paper was presented, at least the proposal for the paper was presented at the Health Systems Global Pre-Conference held in Trinidad in November 2019, and was very supportive in terms of me getting to this stage. And as I mentioned, I'm collaborating with my student, Dr. Sasha Lake. We looked primarily at a lit review. So we looked at WHO PAHO documents, other published documents from the University of the West Indies. Um, we looked at gray literature from the Ministry of Health based on reports they have done and not published, and as well as some specific documents pertaining to Grenada. We did not have to go through the IRB pro review proposal because we did not interview human subjects. Our method of analysis, we use the health policy framework by Gil Walton, Gilson, Lucy Gilson, and that looked at the policy analysis triangle. And while it is a simplified representation of a complex set of interrelationships, we thought it was very useful in terms of understanding our analysis. So we looked at the context, the content, the process, and the actors in the whole agenda of this policy analysis. So over the next few slides, we're going to incorporate content, context, and process as we do a chronology of events over the last 25 years. 
1994, the USAID established this project on healthcare policy planning and financing. And the following year in 1995, the new National Party led by Dr. Keith Mitchell, who is currently the Prime Minister, won the elections eight seats to seven. Informing the government, the OECS Secretariat presented a proposal to the government for the introduction of national health insurance in 1996. The project ended in 97, but Grenada continued to, to discuss health finance and reform and in 1998 started work towards establish a hospital board. They were re-elected to government in 1999, and interestingly, not much happened in terms of national health insurance and health finance and reform for a while. In 2003, that NNP administration was again re-elected to government, this time by an eight to seven majority. And soon after, within a year, we had Hurricane Ivan. This was the dangerous hurricane that dev devastated the country and the damage was over 200% of GDP. It was followed the following year by another hurricane. However, there was a change of government in 2008 where the National Democratic won 11 of the 15 seats. And they, in the budget, advocated for exploring the feasibility of national health insurance. They went on to discuss it. However, by 2013, they lost the election to the new National Party and they are back in power. So in 2013, the government set up an advisory committee to look at national health insurance. They say it's gonna be a priority. Two years later, the report was submitted to cabinet, but again, nothing really happened. In the December 2016 budget, the government again made pronouncements in parliament that they're continuing to develop health finance and reform, and they plan to implement the initiative by the first half of 2017. Again, that did not happen. However, knowing that another election is imminent, they opened the secretariat, got some fun funding through the India, South Africa, Brazil grouping, and the UNDP administered it, and they started to open a secretariat, spend some money on some further research. At the election in 2018, a heavy part of the campaign was implementation of national health insurance and they promised a speedy implementation and they won the government 15 to 0 for the third time 1999 2013 and 2018 15 0. however the university of the west indies health economics unit were implementing the program and by 2018 had a consultation the 2018 budget again the government made pronouncements but interestingly nothing happened for most of 2019 and then by November, the University of the West Indies were removed from the project and a new agreement was signed with a private sector, US-based firm, JIPA. And JIPA created a, a consultation process that led to a national consultation in November 2019 and in January 2020. And since then, nothing has happened. So as a result, we were able to identify who were the key players in developing and implementing national health insurance in Grenada. We documented the historical developments. We looked at the factors that contributed to the process. We looked at the details of the proposal, and even though it is not clear to the public, implementation is still moving ahead. We highlight the role of parties and politics, and still there is no clear indication of when it will be implemented. So Grenada has been discussing this for 25 years. We, have, we know that health finance and reform is critical to achieving universal health coverage and the SDGs, but we see it as important to have genuine consultation to ensure multi-sectoral involvement and look at the the level of support or opposition to the policy proposals. We recognize that the current initiative has been driven by political motives rather than health policy perspectives, and therefore we need to conduct more research and more consultation on the way forward. Thank you very much and for this presentation. Great, thank you very much um, for that final presentation uh, based on document analysis, which is a, a method that is close to my heart. Um, Kennedy was looking at health financing reform in Grenada, um, where over 50% of health expenditure is out of pocket and seeing that for the past uh, 25 years, um, there has been halting progress 
um, towards um, policy proposals um, over all of that time. Um, so we now have time for some questions and answers from the audience. I see that um, there have already been some questions and answers. So thank you very much for um, uh, participating. If you have any questions, please go ahead and put it in the chat box. Uh, we have about 15 minutes. And I would like to start uh, among the questions. Again, thank you very much to all of you who have um, already typed in your questions. I saw that there was a, a key theme. You know, we're talking about politics um, and power. And um, we're talking about policies that are meant to benefit people. We talked about the principle of non-discrimination in the opening um, comments and how universal health coverage uh, is supposed to benefit everyone. Uh, but a lot of the pan, uh, excuse me, a lot of the participants were interested in knowing, um, okay, uh, but how do the people, how do the beneficiaries actually um, get to participate or comment about the policies that are supposed to affect them? So I would like to ask the panelists, uh, each of them, to talk about um, the public participation um, whether that's through any commenting mechanisms, whether that's through co-design um, or any other mechanism, how did that come into play in the um, policies that you were, the UHC policies that you were studying? And if there was no mechanism for uh, public participation, why do you think that was? So um, I think I would like to start with uh, Sulakshana. Please go ahead. Okay, thanks, Sarah. Uh, I hope you can hear me. Uh, so, yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, so for the National Health Insurance Scheme uh, in India, and uh, as it got expanded into PMJY, there was uh, really uh, no scope for any kind of public participation that was elicited, whether in design or implementation or in monitoring. So some of the, uh, uh, you know, mechanisms uh, could have been some, uh, you, uh, you know, various monitoring uh, uh, you know, committees being set up, which has been set up as part of the public uh, uh, government health system uh, delivery um, uh, uh, mechanism. So, but 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 they, they they really did not cater to the insurance scheme. Uh, a huge issue has been tr in terms of transparency of data of how decisions were made within this. Uh, uh, you know, in deciding about the scheme. Um, uh, th there's a long history of it, and I would urge you to read some of the articles on the evolution of the RSBY uh, in India and, uh, you know, how that happened. But if we go come to the recent future, I mean, uh, two years back when the PMJY, which was touted as the world's largest uh, healthcare scheme, uh, which it was really not. Uh, but, uh, you know, even in, in that case, uh, you know, there was a lot of consultations with private sector providers with practitioners, with industry people, but none with patients or with civil society. And I think it has to really do with uh, uh, what objective you think or the government thinks or whoever's designing the scheme or uh, initiating the scheme thinks uh, what, uh, you know, for whom is the scheme being uh, designed or implemented for. And that clearly, uh, you know, it, it, it shows that, uh, you know, the kind of influence that the industries uh, ha has had whether it's insurance or the uh, corporate uh, healthcare industry has had, um, and uh, you know, on this and the other, uh, other than transparency, uh, because it, none, none of the data is available online with so much emphasis on IT systems and software. As a person of the public, I cannot uh, go to the website and check out in my state uh, which are the packages that have been used. Even I mean, even anonymized data is not available. Uh, secondly, uh, I think another reason for no, no public participation has been the collusion, and that has actually uh, increased in the current scheme in which you actually have a separate agency that has been authority that has been formed parallel to the health ministry that is implementing the scheme. And on the board, there are people from the corporate industry and others. So basically, you're legitimizing collusion and you are uh, completely undermining the you know, uh, public uh, ownership and public participation. And I also saw one question about public ownership. And I want to say that uh, you know, public ownership uh, uh, needs to happen. And that can really um, you know, effectively happen in public health systems. And when you have the private sector being prioritized 
and private sector being provided public money, it's very difficult for people to negotiate and intervene in the private sector. You know, they are always in a very vulnerable situation when they are going to the private sector for treatment. And uh, it's very difficult for them to negotiate at that point of time, regardless of any mechanism that you would have could. But to just say that in the design and implementation, no mechanism for public participation has been introduced. Yeah, thank you. Great, thank you. That's uh, very interesting to hear and perhaps is related to some of uh, the findings that, that you described. Uh, now let's move on to Oliver. Oliver, over to you to talk about public participation. Thank you, Sarah. I think the first step to, to develop a, a good citizenship surveillance about the, about the services is um, to encourage the people to, 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 put a, uh, to put the authorities in front of the reality to, to get from them an honest answer about what can be covered and what cannot be covered. Answer is, answering this first question, the, the citizens could lead a, a good surveillance about the quality of the services. And, a responsive, and, and the people assume a responsibility However, if, if we don't know if, 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 the, if the authorities can be clear about what kind of services will be covered or not, I think it's a big problem because we, if we don't answer that first question uh, in, in, in my country, uh, the people don't feel uh, don't feel uh, secure about what kind of rights uh, they can demand. And I think that is a big problem because after many years of bad services, after many years of many bad experiences in the public health sector, the people lost their interest to, to develop a change. The, the, the people simply assume the situation and try to save money to get an attention in the private sector. And that is a big problem in, in Peru. Um, the, emergence, the, the emergence of, of, of private sector in, in some problems that should be covered by the public sector. So to summarize, I think the, 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 the first step is to be transparent about what can do, what can really do the, the government for the people, I think. Great, thank you, Oliver. So coming back to that issue of transparency, which was also discussed by Sulakshana, and the fact that people won't be able to uh, demand their rights if it's not very clear exactly what they're entitled to. Um, thank you. So now let's go to Frank. Frank will speak to us about um, uh, public participation, if any, in the policies in Burkina, in Burkina Faso, la participation publique dans les politiques dont vous avez parlé. Please go ahead, Frank. Okay. Merci bien, Sarah, pour la question. Uh... Ce qu'il faut dire concernant euh, le cas du Burkina Faso, en lien avec la, la participation publique, déjà lorsqu'on prend les politiques en question de façon isolée, on pourrait dire que pour la gratuité des soins, par exemple, avant qu'elle ne passe à l'échelle en 2016, il y avait un certain nombre de projets pilotes qui étaient mis en œuvre, n'est-ce pas, par des ONG et donc, c'était euh, un leadership qui était prôné par les, les ONG et qui, de par leur propre financement, octroyait, permettait à des populations dans leur zone d'intervention euh, de bénéficier euh, de soins gratuits, notamment pour les femmes et les, les, les enfants de moins de 5 ans. Donc, c'est tenant compte de toutes les réussites de ces projets isolés et financé par les ONG, que l'État en 2016 
a décidé de passer à l'échelle. Mais force est de constater que les, les projets, euh, en tout cas réalisés par les, les ONG, ne sont pas, n'ont pas un financement euh, durable. C'est généralement sur une période bien déterminée. Donc, il va sans dire que euh, le passage à l'échelle ne pouvait plus se faire avec ces ONG qui avaient déjà euh, fait leur partition. Donc, l'État, pour la gratuité des soins, est ici le principal bailleur de fonds de la gratuité des soins. Donc, l'État occupe une place importante, euh, justement, dans cette politique. Mais ce qu'il faut dire, c'est que, malheureusement, un des défis que nous avions identifié, c'est que l'État a une faible capacité de mobilisation des ressources. Si bien que malheureusement, il y a beaucoup de retards, euh, la politique a du mal à fonctionner euh, à certains endroits parce que l'État, justement, n'arrive pas à recouvrir les, les, les fonds dus aux, 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 aux formations sanitaires. Donc, il y a une politique qui est prônée par un État, mais qui se voit malheureusement limitée par ses capacités, d'où pour nous la nécessité de véritablement euh, tendre la main, en tout cas, ou octroyer un espace à un secteur autre que euh, celui du secteur public qui permettrait justement de combler le, le vide. Pour l'assurance la, maladie universelle, c'est tout autre chose parce que là, ce n'est plus seulement l'État qui contribue, mais c'est aussi les bénéficiaires des de, de, de soins, les personnes assujetties aux, aux mutuelles de santé qui payent une contrepartie et l'État paye une contrepartie donc. Cela rend assez euh, aisé l'intervention de l'État, quoique euh, il reste aussi le principal euh, acteur de cette politique-là. Donc, ce qui explique aussi que certaines choses ne sont pas encore mises en œuvre parce que pour le, le démarrage, il faut euh, de, de ressources financières suffisamment importantes en ce qui concerne l'assurance maladie universelle. Donc là encore, nous pensons qu'il faut donner de l'espace n'est-ce pas, à, 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 à d'autres stratégies, euh, notamment au niveau du secteur privé, qui pourraient euh, pallier aux insuffisances de l'État, qui est le principal acteur de cette politique. Thank you, Franck. Um, so talking about the pr uh, primary role of the state and the issues of lack of resource mobilization for um, succeeding um, the success of these policies. Uh, Franck, maybe I missed it, but um, it, did you mention any mechanism for ordinary people, beneficiaries to, to comment or participate in this policy? Est-ce qu'il y a un mécanisme quelconque pour que les bénéficiaires participent ou puissent commenter sur les politiques? Alors, si j'ai bien compris la question, dans le cadre de cette réforme qui est de mettre ensemble la gratuité des soins avec, et l'assurance maladie universelle, il est prévu quelque chose que nous, nous avons personnellement apprécié. Parce que, en conséquence, il sera question de rendre durable justement euh, ces, ces, ces deux politiques parce qu'on a vu l'expérience d'autres pays où malheureusement euh, la, la stratégie n'a pas pu euh, durer dans le temps. Et, mais je pense que c'est tenant compte de tout ça qu'au Burkina Faso, en jumelant la gratuité des soins avec l'assurance maladie universelle, la stratégie est de dire que toutes les personnes qui sont bénéficiaires de la gratuité des soins, notamment les femmes et les enfants de moins de 5 ans, pour dorénavant bénéficier des soins gratuits, il faut cotiser à l'assurance maladie universelle. Donc, cela suppose quoi? Cela suppose que euh, pour que je, je puisse bénéficier des soins gratuits auxquels j'ai droit, il faut que je cotise à l'assurance maladie universelle. Et à partir de, de là, l'État ne prendrait plus la totalité des soins gratuits pour les bénéficiaires de la gratuité, mais seulement le ticket modérateur qui, est, euh, qui se situe entre 20 et 30 euh, qui devrait revenir euh, à la charge des bénéficiaires. Donc ça, c'est une stratégie à notre sens qui permettrait véritablement euh, l'implication de tous les acteurs, mais que en conséquence, la, la, la réforme puisse durer dans le temps. Great, thank you for that clarification, Franck. I think um, the different um, possible, the different meanings of participation, um, uh, Franck clarifying that there uh, needs to be a financial participation of beneficiaries in the um, 
health, universal health insurance uh, reform. Um, so I think that f financial participation is absolutely a, a key thing we're talking about. Um, uh, I think let's move on to uh, Rubana, who will uh, talk to us um, about whether or not there um, in the PHC reform in uh, Bangladesh, whether there was a mechanism for uh, public participation, commentary, or uh, involvement in the designer implementation of the reform. Please go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Sarah. So basically the way this urban primary health care uh, program or project was designed was through um, hiring of um, international project designers. But on pen and paper, of course, there's written that you know NGOs, local uh, level um, healthcare providers, and um, the local mayors or governors were included in through, um, during the program design. How much of it has been reflected? How much of it was implemented in practice? Um, it's very difficult to really comment upon. So I will. I would like to. Um, so I think one of my recommendations or way forward was to actually how to have you know contextual understanding, even if international designers are doing it, um, how to collaborate with uh, local level um, programmers or um, specialists in um, you know contextualizing the designs. So. I think I would like to answer one of the questions about ownership and how to uh, actually then give people the power to hold these author health authorities accountable, and what how what really happens in in our countries or in low middle income countries. I, I can um, you know talk from my Bangladesh experiences. Who I think it is a legacy of the colonial period that only the powerful and the knowledgeable here, maybe the technically knowledgeable ones are heeded in or um, given the, you know, um, primacy in making decisions. So people or the general people, common public are not given that, that um, voice. So it really comes down to as you said, um, you know, uh, public participation, people's voice, where is it? And what is needed to get them, get their voice heard during these pro uh, processes? So I don't think it is really a question of just health systems. It's really a question of how the overall political system is in a country. If there is, if, you, if there is no true democracy, if there is no, um, you know, um, civil society, if no um, advocacy groups are, uh, people's advocacy groups are um, given the stage to ever express themselves. So who then brings brings this, um, the people's voice to, to health authorities or, or to the authorities in general? So it's not only the question of health systems really. So it, you know how there's um, political and social determinants of health, it's political and social determinants of health systems as well. Like health system doesn't govern, you know, uh, uh, separate to the overall uh, uh, political system of, of a country. So then, it is not really just health researchers or health providers who needs to question this, this, um, you know, these biases in how program health programs are designed, whose voice is being heard, how, who, how and who are being held, held accountable, even international donors who, who are holding them accountable when they come and design a program and they, they really leave without, you know, even if the outcomes are not being delivered. So I think we uh, please, have to please, uh, wrap up. Thank you. Um, sorry. <laughs> sorry if I have gone off because, uh, but the discourse I think should be not contained within just health systems. It, it, it is a broader discourse. Um, and I think also connected to the now decolonialization of um, you know, global health. They, these are connected. So yeah, Thank we have you. to think that mm -hmm. way. Thank you, Rubana. That's a wonderful way to end this session. Um, 
I think that it's uh, fascinating to see that in this session focused on uh, the politics of universal health coverage, that we have seen um, how little actual um, public participation uh, we actually saw across uh, all of these different contexts. Um, to me, that's quite a fascinating conclusion um, because politics uh, should be about what's um, best for a society and um, include the voices of everyone. And we see that that was um, potentially a flaw across all of these um, universal health coverage reforms. Um, so with that, I would just like to say thank you so much to our wonderful presenters. I really learned a lot from all of you. Um, thank you to the HSR uh, organizers. This is a funny year. I appreciate your work. And um, thank you to the audience members. Those were really some excellent questions um, that enriched our discussion. So um, uh, see you in another session and um, uh, go ahead and head back to the agenda to uh, keep following along. Thank you.